Happy Thanksgiving, pro-life family. So we need to talk about a law that takes away your rights. Emily Cook is with us and she is lit up about this issue. Grab your coffee strap in. Let's get started. Happy Tuesday, pro-life family. Thanks for joining us. We all got properly caffeinated. Mm, coffee. To be. coffee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trying to trying to. Well, I'm on my second one. Kim. I, I just live life on the edge. She's fueled by hate for hospital people, apparently. Oh, um, no, by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yes, we'll get to that conversation shortly. Um, first. It's almost Thanksgiving, right? Mm -hmm. So that means Black Friday is coming. Has everybody gotten their Christmas shopping done? Working on it. Working on it. Working on it. My kids are like making stuff yesterday. And oh. Like, you know, wrecking the dining table. <laughs> but they're working on making their stuff and doing their Friday, Black Friday shopping early. And, nice. You know, if you want to do your Black Friday shopping, you can use the promo code Black Friday on our store. We have cool stuff. I threw it over here on the side. I can reach it. I almost reach it. Got our hats. We brought this shirt back. That shirt is so this, for our audio this popular. Is, the shirt that said the shirt says, I've noticed that everyone who is for abortion has already been born. So that is a quote by President Ronald Reagan, and it's yeah. got a cool little American sunglasses on President Reagan's yep. face. So yes. that's why it's so popular. This it is, is so, so popular. So like, we they did it, fly off the shelves. We did we that on 4th of July and we brought it back because it was like limited run. And then people yeah. were like, but wait, I want that shirt. So we, we don't it keep it up all the time. We yep. have the hat, you know, Timmy back here's got his tiny Tim back here's got his hat on. Yeah, he knows what's up. Um, look, this one, Save the Tiny Texans. We have these That's in lots cute. of colors. Save the Tiny Texans. I love that color. And those shirts are so soft. Like the I colors they wear are white on it. Yeah. We're holding that for the I love the color. And that shirt is so soft because I sleep in it like all the time. Thank you for your narration for the visually impaired. Yes. I love this shirt. I've actually got this shirt. It a says couple Defender, of these. Save the Tiny Texans. Yeah, yeah. This is your new. <laughs> Lawyer and QVC host. Wow. All in one. Oh. But there's a fun quote on the back. Yeah. Thomas Jefferson. Evil triumphs when good men do nothing. Darn right. I, I have I have this in a couple of colors. I wear this and women all yeah. the time. Let's see, every life is precious. Every this life is... has a purpose. Yep. Two things. But wait, there's more. There's more. But wait, there's more. This is the Jeremiah one five uh, yep. scripture. I knew you. I consecrated you. I appointed you. That's pretty awesome. There. Baby feet. I'll hold it up over my face because it's better than looking at my mug. Ah. Uh, so the moral of the story is: go to the Texas Right to Life store. Enter in what was the coupon code? The coupon code is Black Friday. Mm -hmm. Shipping is always free, but there's twenty percent off your cart using the code Black Friday. So that's fun. Yeah. That yeah. helps. Also. For those of you that will watch, listen to this entire program, somewhere I'm going to give you a coupon word. That word will take $20 off your cart. Whoa. $20. Man, that's like a whole free item. It, I did the math. Even some of our like fancier shirts, yeah. it's like you get your shirt for two bucks. Dang. Like that's a pretty good deal. So the first three? Four. Four? Four? Because we're thankful for you. I'll oh, let that's, myself out. That's bad, but <laughs> I'm I'll, proud of it. I'll set it to four. Okay, four people. First four people to use that code, whatever that word is, when I tell you later at some point. No, don't jump to the end. Don't skip to the end. It's not I see there. you get your finger off that button. No, don't skip to the end. That's not where I'm going to tell you. At some point in this program, I will tell you what that word is, and then you can go use it. You're a sneaky man, bro. I am. Okay. But that's our giveaway. You can't call in to win because there's we don't we don't have phone. No I one's mean, gonna answer. We have phones, but I mean, this is pre-recorded, so it's podcast. It's not live radio. So, yeah, keep watching, keep listening. We'll tell you that word later. We got some other stuff this week. We though, do huh? have some other stuff this week. It's the holiday season, and hospitals like to. Get all friendly with this law that we have in Texas that we lovingly refer to as the 10-day rule. 
You're yeah, you're exactly right. And it does seem that anytime we we have a holiday, if it's the 4th of July, if it's Memorial Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, that more and more patients are victimized during the yeah. holidays by uh, efforts to initiate the Texas 10 day rule on their lives. And, you know, that's one of the things that's what we're going to talk about today is a lot of our listeners uh, probably don't know what the 10 day rule is and why it is um, a pro-life issue and um, what you can do to yep. um, help stop it. Well, and everybody acted like uh, when Obamacare passed, oh, it's going to create death panels. Texas. We already had that. Has had death panels since. 1999? Mm-hmm. 1999. So we're the first state to come up with that. And mm-hmm. so if you were mad that Obamacare created something similar, they just looked at Texas law and went, hey, look, that right. sounds fun. Yeah. So we'll, well, let's start with what is the 10-day law? And right. I, I want to give you a couple examples to put into to put in how this plays out in real life, and then we'll explain how the law impacts that. So uh, one patient, we've got a a patient in um, an ICU setting. She's an older woman. She's conscious, but she has a trach, um, which means she is uh, breathing with the assistance of a ventilator through her um, through her throat or her neck right. on the ex- externally placed. And that's my, a form of long-term care. If mm-hmm. someone needs long-term ventilation, which is defined as after 14 days. So she's got, she's receiving dialysis. She's in the ICU and she is breathing with the assistance of a, of a trach. Okay. The hospital decides um, they do not want to continue treating her. And so they tell the family, the, her husband, who is, they say, Shh, we're going to remove life-sustaining treatment from her, which means the trach and the, vent- and the dialysis treatment. And she will pass away when you do that. Um, mm-hmm. So it's called life sustained treatment. Yeah. She's conscious looking around. They start the 10 day process on her at the end of um, when this process is completed uh, after 10 days, then the hospital removed her ventilator and she continued to live. Yeah. And then they said, okay, well now she's lived through the night. So we're going to, uh, we still want her to die. Okay. Mm-hmm. So now we're not going to give her dialysis. Wait, 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 wait. This is hospitals. Correct, correct. Hospitals and physicians. So, but dialysis is a fairly simple process. Yeah. Absolutely, she Absolutely. was already on dialysis before she even went to the hospital. Uh-huh. And so they they say we're not going to give her dialysis, and by the underneath the law, they didn't have to do that. And this woman's name was Carolyn Jones, and she lived right here in Houston. Another um, case, uh, another example is we've got a an a man in ICU in Corpus Christi who is also conscious. He's flipping the TV. Um, mm-hmm. He's being able to watch TV and mm-hmm. push the nurse's call button. He too um, has a ventilator um, or a trach um, through that's helping him breathe and requires dialysis as well. The hospital has, he has told his brother, who's his medical power of attorney, I want to continue receiving treatment. And the hospital has said, yeah, we're going to start the 10 days on on you and uh, right here in the middle of things. Wait, 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 wait. Let's back up again. Mm-hmm. You said he has a medical power of attorney. Yes, his absolutely. His brother has a medical power of attorney. Correct. All right so there forms. is a conscious, mm-hmm. full control of his faculties person representing him with full legal authority. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. And they can say the hospital under color of state law, well, we're just not going to, we're going to start this 10 day process on you and we don't have to continue after 10 days providing this treatment to you without, with, out which he will die. Then contrast that with we've got a 14 year old in El Paso that the um, who's actually a resident of New Mexico, um, but the hospital wanted to remove her ventilator as well and pursue it to the 10 day law. Now she has a mother. Okay, she has a father. Mm-hmm. All right. They have not been judged to be unfit parents or have their decision-making capabilities, but the law doesn't matter. Legal guardians, yes. They don't, the law doesn't matter. The hospital, the, the law allows the hospital to come in and say, we don't have to, um, we're going to go through this process. And at the end of this process, we're going to remove life sustaining treatment over your daughter. And there's nothing you can do about it. Or so they like to say. But so that, those are the, those are how this, this plays out. So let's talk about, okay, what does the 10 day law, the process actually mean? 
you are a patient who is um, typically in an ICU. It doesn't have to be limited to an ICU, but that's when we mostly see it. Um, and you are receiving some forms of life-sustaining treatment. That can be blood pressure medicines that are administered intravenously. Um, that can be a ventilator, a dialysis. Those are the three main types of um, and, and combinations of treatment that we receive. But artificially administered food and water is also life-sustaining treatment, as that makes sense in our heads. Yeah. And and uh, there becomes a disagreement. The physician or a physician who is providing care to that patient says, I don't want to do this anymore for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. okay? It can be non-medical reasons. Yeah, for whatever Again, 99.99999% of the time it's for non-medical reasons. And yes, absolutely. And it's usually that little term they throw around about quality of life. Yeah. And we, we will get to that. And... Mm -hmm we will get to what, how those quality of life judgments come into play in the statute. Um, but they say, I, we want to, Hey mom, we need to remove life support from your daughter. And she, mom says, uh, heck no, you're not. Oh, uh, well then the hospital, the physician has this process in state law. Um, it is chapter 166046 of the Texas health and safety code. We can put that in the notes, um, for you all to click on. Um, but the, the physician has an, an out, they go and ask for an ethics consult um, with the hospital hospital ethics committee, and and this is a bunch of people who are bioethicists. So every hospital every hospital has an ethics committee, and they've served different functions. Um, usually, um, they they usually they are in an advisory role. They are trying to um, maybe resolve communication differences, or maybe it is you know, a treatment like the hot family wants one treatment and it's too risky, or there's an experimental treatment that the doctors want to try, but it might cause immense suffering. Like just any kind of ethical quandaries, they serve different functions. That's outside of the 10 day rule. Correct. Right? Correct. So they serve different functions and they are made up by anybody um, in the hospital. It is kind of a rotating basis. There's chaplains, social workers, case managers, nurses, different types of doctors uh, involved. But when you start this, what we call 046 or TADA or 10 day rule, there are all different terms to kind of use to describe this process. Oh. The ethics committee then turns from a um, consultant role to a binding decision maker role. Ooh. And if, and so the hospital, the physician says, Hey, I need the ethics committee on this case. Well, then the family um, under the statute is supposed to get notice. Okay. Um, they are only required 48 hours notice. So the doctor comes and says, Hey, um, we are or the chaplain. Somebody is going to come and say, Hey, we're having this meeting where your loved ones continued treatment is going to be discussed. You are invited to attend. Um, and it's going to be in two days at four o'clock in this tower of this building. And that the community is coming. That's all the host the family knows what's going on. And they go to this meeting where there will be anywhere from 12 to 16 um, people that they've never met. They are meeting for the first okay. time. The These people have never met the patient either. Correct. Um, and the physician who called the meeting, who asked for it, will present his um, side as to why his decision to um, stop providing life-sustaining treatment, to withdraw life-sustaining treatment from the patient, why the ethics committee should say, yes to that. And then the family will present their side as to why they their decision to continue life-sustaining treatment for their loved one should be approved. Now, if the ethics committee at that point gets to decide, do I agree with the physician or the family? If they agree with the physician, then the hospital sends, gives a letter to the family that says the ethics committee has um, agrees with your attending physician that life-sustaining treatment is quote unquote medically inappropriate. And we'll get to that term in a second, medically inappropriate. And thus after 10 days, we are no longer from receipt of this letter, we are no longer obligated to provide care to your um, loved one. That's where it gets the word 10 days from. And at the end of 10 days, if that uh, person is still in their facility, then the hospital staff and the physicians are um, completely empowered and immune from liability from normal types of immunity um, to remove, pull the plug, withhold dialysis, 
Take out your blood pressure IV, your IV that's giving you blood pressure medicines. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you're conscious. Doesn't matter if your, your MPO is saying, hey, no, I want this. Doesn't matter if you've executed a will to live or a document that says, I want these, um, these treatments to be continued. Matters not. Hospital can come in there, turn off everything, and you die. It doesn't matter if you're awake and you say, I want these things. I mean, that's, that's basically self-fulfilling prophecy, though, right? You're going to pull this stuff if you don't give somebody water for a couple of days. Right. And food and water. die. In so, the original law, uh, it was legal for several years, to for a little over 15 years, to take away um, food and water from patients. Uh, kind of like Terry Shivo, how, that's how mm. she died. She was yeah. starved and dehydrated mm. to death. Yeah, and until, that was amended in 2015. Yeah, until 2015, food and water w removal was part of um, this this way, this way. And now it it still is. It's possible, um, but it is limited to circumstances um, in which the law is written so, so narrowly that it is limited to circumstances in which your body cannot process food and water, yeah. which happens, and which yeah. is appropriate at that point yeah. to do that. But um, it's, it's appropriate at that point. Um, but we still have this and, and, and I want to talk, we've been in a lot of conversations about, um, what are these, what do these terms mean? What is, um, what are some of the common, um, misconceptions about the law and what question is the law actually supposed to be answering? So I think we're about out of time and need to take a quick break here and we'll get back to those questions. Save the date for Boots on the Ground. It's an awesome pro-life conference coming up January 28th and 29th. Come to Austin, Texas with us to march to the Capitol, to celebrate the end of Roe v. Wade, to commemorate Roe v. Wade, and to learn from expert pro-life speakers on how to keep Texas pro-life forever. Come to Austin with us and hear from Ryan Bomberger, our keynote speaker who shares his personal story, and so much more. Book your tickets today, bootsonthegroundtx.com. See you in January. Without warning, you or your loved one could end up in the emergency room where every second counts and your medical wishes matter more than ever. However, if your loved one doesn't have the right medical documents on hand, they may not be able to make decisions for you in a crisis. My Life Angels solves all of this by walking you through step-by-step -step in creating these important medical documents and storing them online securely for you and your family to access at any time. The service is only $7 a month, but use the link in our description for 20% off your initial subscription period. Don't let strangers make life and death decisions for you. Get the My Life Angels app today. Welcome back, friends. So we need to continue this conversation about the law and what, how this was supposed to work, what questions it's supposed to answer, but doesn't. Um, first, I need to give you the promised code word. It's Thanksgiving. Just type in Thanksgiving. You can stack it with your Black Friday discount. So if you are watching this and you want to buy a shirt for next to nothing, Thanksgiving. Okay. Mm. Happy Thanksgiving, guys. Yeah. Um, so in the interest of helping other people have happy Thanksgivings, mm. <laughs> <sighs> Let's get back to talking about this terrible law. Sure. Okay. So for listeners, for recap, we're talking about the Texas's 10-day law here. Yes. And people get real antsy when you call it, when, when you throw out the term euthanasia. Oh, oh no. Yeah. We don't have euthanasia. Uh, we, we do. <laughs> yeah. We do. I mean, and, if you're if you're removing life-sustaining treatments, if you're withdrawing it, here, withholding it. Yeah. That is called passive euthanasia. It is a form of euthanasia. Um, and we need to call it what it is because what is... What we are, the medical community has been very successful mm -hmm. in convincing their protégés and, and, and their, their students. We've got an entire generation of healthcare providers who have grown up in this atmosphere of cloaking euthanasia into terms like dignity, suffering. Um, it, it's... And, and so you have even good pro people who doctors, physicians who consider themselves pro-life. They have been they have been told that something that's black is really white. And um, you got to take a step back and we're going to we're going to talk about a couple of those uh, a couple of those things. So what is what is medically inappropriate? That is the only standard um, in the law. And there's no definition for medically inappropriate. It's also not 
it's not medical standard of care. Standard of care in legal terms, that is a very defined decades of right. um, of jurisprudence behind it to de develop what does standard of care mean. And what we see is um, medical medically inappropriate is this, no one can define it. So it gets to be whatever you want it to be. Oh, magic. Exactly. And for instance, one of our cases, and this happens a lot, um, one of our cases, it's not that the patient can't be transferred to another facility. It is that there's an administrative hangup with their insurance. And so because there's no standards or reason to prove medically inappropriate, the hospital feels empowered to utilize this process um, in order to get rid of a patient it, it, because they are having trouble with, it, with insurance paying. Well, instead of waiting for insurance to pan out, like that takes time right. and effort on everybody's part. This law on the books incentivizes hospitals to get rid of patients for other reasons other than medical need um, or medical feasibility because they don't have to justify it by anything. This, this lack of a standard is um, extremely, I, I was in a conversation, um, I was in a conversation the other day, last week at the Capitol, where a healthcare provider was talking about a case that they had and, and was saying that the nurses were really upset because they thought that um, dad was, that dad and the patient, it was his son, that they had different ideas about what the son wanted. And I said that, I said to the healthcare practitioner, the appropriate tool for that then is to go find a different, go to guardianship and get a a, a court process that says, that determines who should be the law, lawful surrogate. Exactly. Don't just institute, you you cannot, as healthcare providers, decide, make that judgment. Mm -hmm. Think of it this way. The 10-day law, it is not about whether a patient is suffering. We hear that all the time. Um, healthcare practitioners are like, well, we need a way to stop treating patients that just, that, that make us feel bad, that make us, um, we, we, I'm like, no. Make us feel bad. Like, no, that's not, that's not your, that's not your role. You are not, you are in an advisory role. You are in a consult, consult, consulting role to take care of a patient and to help them and their surrogates make solid healthcare decisions, but you don't get to make those decisions for them. And guess what? There's 49 other states that do it that way, where if there is a disagreement that uh, I think this dad is causing suffering to his son, you can go to court and have an independent person look at that situation and assess whether uh, you're right and that patient is suffering and this dad might have ulterior motives um, or they might side against the hospital. The problem with one of the many problems with the 10 day rule is guess who makes up that uh, ethics committee? Guess who's all on that panel? Mm -hmm. People employed by the hospital. And, and who work every day with the person who's asking them to make this decision. Yeah. And think about it. Who, when we talk about who has the decision-making rights, um, aren't you, Brent, the closest person to your wife? I mean, I would like to think so, yes. <laughs> uh, and, and so you, what, y'all been married for how many years? Coming up on 17. Okay, so you know better, you may not know perfectly, but you definitely know better about what your wife would want in changing circumstances than nurses who might have been taking care of them for two for her, her for a month, three weeks. Um, yeah. Think and so. so why objectively things may look different to one person, we have to take the step back and say, okay, wait a minute. Whose decision is this? Should I be substituting this person, should I be involved in substituted decision-making for um, this patient? Is that my role? The answer is no. The law allows it to be their role. And that's why we yeah. so fiercely contest the law and contest the utilization of it and try to change the law. Uh, but getting back, when we, we have these conversations, so many times I feel I, these healthcare practitioners are trying to make the law, make their practice easier. And we're not here. We all have aspects of our job that we don't like. It doesn't matter how much we love, but 
That's life. It that is. That coffeeer down the hall that jams every like 20 minutes. Right. I hate that thing. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I get to go, well, fixing this makes me tired and feel bad. And I get tired of fixing it because I just have to keep fixing it. No, people want to print stuff. I got to go right. fix the darn thing. Exactly. And so what is the proper role of government? What is the proper role of the state of Texas? Is the state of Texas to say, we're going to craft this policy that and have this policy in place that if the healthcare team think, if someone on the healthcare team thinks that this patient's life is not worth living, then we're going to give them the power to do that. Brent, I because cannot- Because it gives them the sads? I know. Brent, I can't come to you and say, you know, or a teacher can't come to you and say, Brent, Robin, I just don't think that your kids are in the right school and we're going to move them somewhere else. They oh, that would be ridiculous. Like, yeah, you can't do that. That's the same. Because you have parental rights. And, and until a lengthy court process comes- into play and a judge and evidence is presented, a judge rules and all appeals exhausted, you retain the rights, this fundamental right to make decisions for your health care for, I mean, for your children. Yes. But a doctor can walk into the ICU room of, with, and tell a 20 year old mother, hey, we don't think that your daughter should continue living. So we're going to remove her life support on November 9th. And you better make sure all your family is here to say goodbye. That happened. That, that's Tinsley Lewis. That's where we are. And yeah. we need to take a step back. This is not about requirements for hospitals. This is not about eth the law. It's not about eth resolving ethical quandaries for physicians or bedside nurses. I'm sorry. That is, it, it's a harsh thing to say, but that is not the function of state policy. What this policy does is says, when do we get, when does the legal surrogate get the right to make decisions? And it narrows that down. It, it takes the it takes away the ability of surrogates to make decisions, narrows it down to 10 days without, no judge has said this person is unfit to make decisions for their wife, for their child, for their brother, for their mom. No one has said that. There's yeah. not been any evidence presented, um, nothing that would pass constitutional due process, but we have allowed it to happen and clothed, cloaked it with immunity. So it is It is not about how long should this patient continue to live. It is not about how long, um, you know, what someone's subjective view of suffering is and what that trade-off is. It is who gets to make that decision. Mm -hmm. yeah. And... As a surrogate, one of the 10 days, there's a lot of conversations about, should we um, should we expand the 10 days? Text Rights Life would love to do away with all of the 10 days, with a countdown to begin with, okay? we that That is our preferred state of affairs. Um, but the political re reality is, okay, well, do we extend the timeline, um, extend the days? And extending the days is basically, and I said this in a meeting last week, it is about how long does the legal surrogate get to get? How long are we as the state of Texas going to give the legal surrogate the ability to have their health care directive respected? Do we give them 10 days? Do we give them 30 days? 90 days? 120 days? H how long? That take that is because that's what we're taking away. How long did it take in the Tensley case before the hospital finally figured out? That Over 800 days. Yeah, we're yeah we're at like a thousand or something now, but which if uh, right, but before she was, was released, I that guess. was from. I mean, we just hit the two year mark last week, but yeah. um, that was from the time that the hospital started. Said you have ten days left. Better get your loved ones here to say goodbye because we're going to take her off of life sustaining treatment. She will suffocate to death. Have a nice day. Yeah, that's the reality uh, of that. To the time she went home in March because she improved so much and that she is still at home today. So it's been um, several years now since, oh wait, no, three years, I'm sorry, three 2019. Years. Yeah, yeah, 2019, three years. Three years since uh, that all happened and uh, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Sometimes these committees are called medical futility. There's sometimes they're called ethics committee and you'll hear, and you'll hear sob stories. We hear them in the Capitol all the time. Sob stories about, um, ethical quandaries. And I, at the end of the day, what right trumps? Yeah. Does, do your feelings trump my ability to live? Or do your feelings trump my ability to make healthcare decisions for my son? Yeah. Uh, right now, uh, the state of Texas says the feelings trump. Yeah. Okay, we have to change that and we have to stop getting sidetracked mm -hmm. of these very nebulous, 
um, mm -hmm. subjective, mm -hmm. uh, oh, everything, you know, the doctors are always right and we have to just right. go with it and realize what rights are we actually taking away mm -hmm. without a court of law, without a judicial intervention from families and patients. Yeah. And guess what? If you still have those sob stories, and you know what? They do exist. There are some times where um, families will be asking for something that might not be appropriate for a patient. Go to court. That's really well, it. And that's and that's different. And, and, and one of the things is like, that's why the, the def understanding what the definition of life-sustaining treatment is, is so important because it is not, we're not talking about families coming in and asking for um chemo treatments for an ail, you know, for some sort of uh, non-cancer situation. I mean, we're not talking about extraordinary yeah. treatment. We're talking about to breathe, to have your kidneys filtered. Mm -hmm. it, it's very, to have your blood pressure stabilized, you know, instead of swallowing medicine, I'm getting it through an IV. It, it's very, very basic. And again, here's something, you know, else to think about. The two common misconceptions. Okay. One, we're talking about treatment that is working. Mm. The, the, we're, we are not in this situation where yeah. the treatment isn't working, okay? The ventilator is helping you breathe. The dialysis is filtering your kidneys. Yes. Blood pressure is stabilizing your blood pressure. Your food and water, helping you have food and water. Mm -hmm. These are working. And it's the fact that they're working is why they want the patients to remove them because they think it's better for the patient to die based on quality of life decisions than... Um, then to continue living. And then the second, and we've got some great clips of quality of life decisions. Maybe we can throw that oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. commentary on our, on our YouTube of these are meetings. Texas Rights Life has been in mm -hmm. where it is yeah. clear they are saying that the reason they've called this ethics committee meeting and want to remove treatment pursuant to the 10-day law is because of the physician's view of the quality of life of that per person. I'm sorry, they can make that decision for their spouse, but you're not making that decision for my spouse. Mm -hmm. The second misconception is that, well, these patients will just continue to live forever and ever and ever. That would be uh, unheard okay. of. Wow. Is patients... Jesus in the hospital? <laughs> <laughs> what? No, last I checked, he's been a long way from some of those hospitals. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And I think we've talked about this a couple times before, um, uh, but for instance, the ventilator. Okay, if I hook a cor corpse, up to a ventilator. Is that it's corpse going to start breathing? It's not going to fix anything. It's not happening. It's not, it's not happening because, yes, the ventilator is helping push oxygen into you, but your body's doing the rest of it. So if your body's not functioning, they pump that no oxygen are, are in. You, it's not going to do anything. If this was futile, futile, continuing to give these services, Correct. the patient could still die. Correct. And that's another If they're going to die in a matter of a couple of days anyway, mm -hmm. they could keep doing these things and that person yes. will... You can die on a ventilator, mechan mechanical ventilation. Any life-sustaining treatment that we have will not keep a person alive forever. Yes. And the terms, even the terms mechanical ventilation is not an accurate representation of what's coming because doesn't that seem, that seems very rigid and machine oriented and kind it's like it's does. doing all robotic, right? Yes. Okay. Forced. That's not accurate. Okay. But it's been termed that. And that to evoke and, and it evokes um, feelings and, and notions of that this is something that's not natural. Okay, and and your so body is still them working. Into Darth Vader is what correct, saying. correct. Okay. And likewise, the term futile. People think futile means it's not working. Well, it's supposed to be that way. But the problem is that definition and the usage of futile has mm. now. It has now morphed into more of a, well, if I can't get you back to how you were before, it's mm -hmm. futile. The care is futile. I, well, that might not necessarily be true. That might not necessarily be, that, that It's not futile. I may not be able to get you back to where you were before, but that doesn't mean the treatment's not working for you. And it's not yeah. futile because if you've decided and talked to your wife that, you know, hey, if I can still be around and not, if I can still be around, then I want to be around. It doesn't matter if I can't go run a triathlon. I can't really do that now anyway. Guys. Right. Go. Um, but you're futile, Brent. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks, you know, Kim. And, and so Appreciate especially it. we work with a lot of attorneys and one of my jobs here is to try to help other attorneys um, and bring them in to help resolve these disputes and stuff. And so one of the, every time and... <sighs> We have a case and the question comes up as, well, what's wrong with the patient? 
That's actually irrelevant. Because yeah, kind of is, isn't it? What we're talking about is who gets to decide, make that, make the decision of whether mm. um, health care is continued. It doesn't doesn't really matter how what is wrong with the patient. Right. Because that's not that's not the appropriate role of any government policy mm-hmm. at all. And that's definitely not for me to decide for somebody else to inform my decision about what should happen to someone else. No, mm. all we can do is make sure that the person who's best suited to make that decision, whose right it is to make that decision, gets to keep that decision. Yeah, yeah. That's all that matters. That's not too much to ask. That you know seems what? that seems reasonable. That, There's that forty nine other states that have that, so you know they might not be too and too bad. Well, I am I'm done with my soapbox. So if there's anything that you two have think I, I have missed I that we need to book, please let done, me know. You're done with your soapbox. That was but. a thorough debunking of the 10 day rule. Because when you're having these conversations, you know, you get those questions about like, well, what if, you know, we can't just give all of the power to the family. We can't just let them have like ask for anything they want and the doctor has to give it to them. Here's another here's another example, okay? And it just drives me nuts every time they say this. If you, um, you can go back in some of our archives in 2015, there's a story of Chris Dunn, okay? Houston man, he is praying to live on video. Yes, okay. we have that video. Yes. Um, in some of these capital, in some of these meetings, um, there, there are some comments made of like, what was done to Chris Dunn is unconscionable. Chris Dunn, Said he wanted to, con- he wanted that. He wanted to continue trying to live. And his mother also agreed. What you think here in Austin about what decisions should have been made is completely irrelevant to the state policy, the policy of the state of Texas. You can make that decision for your wife, but you don't get to make that decision for somebody else 200 miles away. And we got to keep that perspective when we start talking about whether the 10 day law is good public policy. I mean, I don't think it's ever historically gone well when the government starts deciding, you know, long-term life decisions for anyone. Mm-hmm. Just just saying history says that's it's bad when the government decides who lives. Yeah. So, so I hope this has been helpful. Um, this is an area of um, the attacks on end of life. And, and, and that's mm-hmm. another bad term, end of life. Like these patients are not at their end of their life. No. Okay. They just need more help. Well, they now, will be if you take away all their all Correct. Their yes. Now, sometimes treatment. they might. Sometimes we've had patients who in, in the 10-day countdown, they pass away naturally mm-hmm. on vent, uh, with the use of the ventilator, Shock. right? Because they were dying. We don't need this. You don't, you Why want do you them to, to die it? two days earlier? Yeah. Does really? that make your life a well, lot better? We, we, we can't look, we cannot look at policy through that types of, of lens. The, the ends don't just, the outcome doesn't justify the means. It's no. just, no. You, you, we got to keep going. So, so I hope that, and, and you have to be vigilant on this because if we're not, it's kind of like how abortion crept in. Like we started mm-hmm. doing a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. I mean, even the, mm-hmm. I mean, even the term abortion didn't mean back in the, originally what it means now right. today. Right. You've got to be, we've got to be very vigilant as pro-lifers to peel back the layers and say like, wait, you said that word. What does that actually mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, are you trying to mm-hmm. redefine what that word means? Because if not, if we turn a blind eye to it, it's going to be real bad before mm-hmm. we before we know it. And then we're done. Mm-hmm. And in the interest of ending on a slightly happier note, does anybody have any good Thanksgiving plans? <laughs> I'll just say I don't have to cook. I got out of cooking. Hey. And I got out of cooking. Not that I do much anyways, but I do try to cook during just, the holidays. You just took up the grandparents for the grandkids. And yes. Food yes. Food happens. So I agreed to um, let other people host for host for Thanksgiving Day. And there you go. Fun. I'm I'm just, we, we host. So there you go. That'll be fun. Honestly, I can't wait to get my fall dishes up and get my Christmas ones <laughs> out. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. what I plan to do this week. Yeah. Decorate for Christmas. That's what I'm going to be doing too. That'll be fun. All right, guys. Well, enjoy your Thanksgiving plans. Remember, you can use code Black Friday on our store. And that other word I said earlier, mm. uh, you can, yeah, if you just jump to the end, there you go. It was earlier. Sorry. You missed it. So we love you guys. Thank you for watching. Have an amazing Thanksgiving, and we will see you next week. 